spiritual democracy in the American psyche and the world soul. I'm uh, making this YouTube uh, video today um, because there's been some question about uh, what it, spiritual democracy uh, really is. Um, it's not really uh, that clear if you do a, a Google search and you see the uh, uh, the vast array of uh, posts uh, that are um, uh, coming up about spiritual democracy, whether it's in India or in Pakistan uh, or in the United States. Um, there's... Uh, there's really um, a history here that needs to be understood. And uh, that's the reason for this uh, video this uh, morning, um, which I will now um, uh, be presenting to you uh, live. And uh, I'm doing this from a PowerPoint that I uh, have written up. So I'm switching to that now if there's uh, some uh, brief interruption in the uh, uh, flow of this presentation. It's because I'm uh, switching uh, to the um, uh, to the PowerPoint so I can read from that. So uh, I will be uh, with you um, uh, in the uh, webcam, uh, but I will be reading mostly from the. Um, uh, PowerPoint that I've written up, and that way it uh, will be uh, clear uh, to the viewers uh, what exactly uh, is meant by the term spiritual democracy, which really needs to de be defined uh, for a postmodern uh, contemporary audience. So one of the central myths in the United States of America is what I've called a spiritual democracy. Um, spiritual democracy really is founded upon the great law of peace, which was the Iroquois uh, Algonquin uh, myth of the um, uh, hero figure Hiawatha. And um, the great law of peace was a notion uh, that had a great influence on the founding of American democracy as the basis for advancing a new world spirit that coincides with the early writings of Benjamin Franklin, who was a deist and a Freemason. Franklin's many discussions with Native American nations during the uh, many treaty councils he attended and published from his own printing press in Philadelphia, prior to the American Revolution led to the establishment of a government based not on a declaration of war, but on Kayaneokeoaka, uh, which translates as the great law of peace. Excuse me for my pronunciation there. I didn't uh, uh, have the, uh, uh, the exact uh, uh, intonation of that uh, interesting word. Um, the idea of religious relativism is not uh, new uh, to the, uh, the Constitution of uh, the United States in the First Amendment <clears throat> on religious liberty. It actually comes from the Native American tribes, from uh, First Nation people. Um, this idea is found in uh, the Iroquois Treaty. And uh, no national god images are present in the writing of the United States Constitution, save one. And this is uh, the one god that unites many gods of many nations into a new world a God that is a transnational notion that Thomas Jefferson preserved from his discussions with the founding fathers in the making of the Declaration of Independence. They referred to it <clears throat> simply as nature's God.
This idea of the unity of the human race was expressed most clearly by the founding fathers in the term uh, e pluribus unum in Latin, which means out of many, uh, the one. So some of the major contributors to a notion of spiritual democracy in the United States was the uh, scientist, a uh, German-Prussian uh, uh, scientist, Alexander von Humboldt. Uh, his dates were 1769 to 1859. And uh, <clears throat> he traveled uh, to South America, Central America, and Mexico and returned with uh, maps uh, to uh, uh, show uh, Jefferson uh, in uh, 1804. And these maps uh, contributed to uh, the um, adventures of Lewis and Clark, as well as uh, some of the very early maps uh, uh, of the continental United States. <clears throat> Humboldt called uh, the sense of unity or oneness uh, in his book, uh, five volume set, uh, Cosmos, published in 1844, uh, the feeling uh, of the infinite in his book, uh, which was called, interestingly, Cosmos. Um, now, Carl Gustav Jung, who I'll be speaking about in this presentation, uh, called uh, the experience of cosmic unity uh, the feeling for the infinite. So you see the language uh, that they both used, uh, both as scientists, um, is uh, analogous. Uh, one of the early uh, uh, major influences on the notion of spiritual democracy was Ralph Waldo Emerson, his dates were 1803 to 1882. And uh, he read von Humboldt's uh, book Cosmos in German when it was first published, the first volume in 1844, as I mentioned. And um, later, uh, this would be picked up by Walt Whitman in um, uh, his uh, early manuscripts that led to the publication of Leaves of Grass in 1855. Now in the same year, uh, Longfellow uh, published the narrative poem, Hiawatha, the Song of Hiawatha, 1855. And um, in, uh, In 1987, uh, the U.S. Congress uh, expressed a debt of gratitude uh, to the Iroquois Confederacy and other uh, Indian nations uh, by the Republic of the United States uh, in a document which shows uh, that there was a late uh, acknowledgement of the uh, origins of the, the concept of a uh, re religious relativism or religious liberty already uh, there in the United States prior to the coming of uh, Columbus uh, and the explorers to the, uh, uh, to the continent. Uh, several historians have noted that uh, in addition to uh, Franklin, the founding fathers, uh, James Madison, uh, Jefferson, and John Adams, all integrated notions of the great law of peace into US policies. Much later, these ideas were carried forward in the passage of Resolution 76 that was introduced into the US Congress in, as I said, 1987, when a debt of thanks was finally repaid to the Iroquois Confederacy and other nations by the Republic of the United States on the occasion of the 200th anniversary of the signing of the U.S. Constitution. 
This event was preceded by a 1977 presentation of a document that had been called Basic Call to Consciousness by a Seneca elder, John Mohawk, to a United Nations conference in none other than Geneva, Switzerland, Carl Jung's home base. The Iroquois Treaty of Peace was at the foundation not only of the writing of the US Constitution, but it's also one of the central principles in the United Nations, education, scientific and cultural organization, or UNESCO. Jung was unaware uh, of the role of the Iroquois on the development of his own spiritual attitude Nevertheless, he first encountered Hiawatha in the American Miss Miller's fantasies that were published in his 1912 book, Symbols of Transformation, or what was known in the United States as the psychology of the unconscious. In a 1916 uh, publication uh, by uh, uh, Hinkle, So what are some of the psychological variables that uh, are involved in spiritual democracy? Well, in 1948, uh, Carl Jung uh, outlined to UNESCO his specific thoughts and recommendations on what is required to avert wars in an essay called Techniques of Attitude Change Conducive to World Peace. Now to the question of what religion is the most universal, uh, Walt Whitman had answered uh, by 1855, all are equals. <clears throat> so equality is really at the foundation of spiritual democracy. Now there are three basic strata <clears throat> that Whitman, Carl, excuse me for a moment, Whitman hypothesized these three basic strata of American democracy. The first he called the political stratum. <clears throat> the second was the material stratum or the economic uh, strata. And the third is what he called the religious uh, or the spiritual stratum. And uh, that's what I'm calling spiritual democracy. Now, in 1925, uh, Carl Jung noted uh, that Symbols of Transformation, which again was published in 1912, seemed to forecast the future. Indeed, it did, and it did in his own writings as well. Jung had stated uh, in his early uh, work in 1912, uh, Van Lungen und Symbole der Libido in German, uh, from poets we learn much about fantasy thinking or non-directed thinking, whereas from science we learn little. Of course, if we... Uh, uh, add uh, Alexander von Humboldt into the mix, then we learn a great deal, just as we did from Louis Agassiz, who was a student of Humboldt's, with whom uh, William James traveled uh, to South America, tracing the course that Humboldt had taken down uh, to Brazil in the Amazon. William James, as a young man, was uh, working for the laboratory in uh, Harvard in natural science, collecting uh, fish specimens with Agassiz. Now, our first transnational uh, text on spiritual democracy was The Varieties of Religious Experience, published in uh, 1902 by William James. 
Uh, James's dates were 1842 to 1910. And Carl Jung met uh, William James twice in 1909 when he lectured at Clark University, and then again in 1910 when he returned the following year, uh, just prior to uh, William uh, James's uh, death uh, to uh, symptoms of angina. Now here's a interesting statement from William James, which applies, I think, to what our current uh, world situation is like with regards to democracy, not just here in America. He said, democracy is on trial and no one knows how it will stand the ordeal. If democracy is to be saved, it must catch the higher, healthier tone. How true that is today. Now, in um, the varieties of religious experience, uh, William James defended experience against philosophy. The problem I have set myself is a hard one, he wrote to a friend. First, to defend experience against philosophy as being the real backbone of the world's religious life and second, to make the hearer or reader believe what I myself invincibly do believe, that although all the special manifestations of religions may have been absurd, I mean its creeds and theories, yet the life of it as a whole is mankind's, humankind's, we could say, most important enduring function. This is also what he called a religious function, a term that Jung would later borrow in his own psychology of individuation, uh, particularly at his lecture at Yale University in 1937, his seventh and final trip to the United States. Now in putting forth a hypothesis of a science of religion, William James, wrote in his conclusions that one religious experience invokes our individual or private destiny. Two, it rehabilitates the feeling element in religion and subordinates its intellectual parts. Three, it leads to the fact that the conscious person is continuous with a wider self through which saving experiences come. And four, the pragmatic way of taking religion is the deeper way, because it gives the body as well as the soul some characteristic realm of fact as its very own. Now, in Jung's a book, Psychological Types, published in 1921, in uh, chapter eight, The Type Problem in Modern Philosophy, he has a 21-page uh, overview of William James's types. He talks about the characteristic pairs of opposites in James's types, and then he uh, proceeds with a general criticism of James's typology. I've uh, taken a very close look at all this in my book, William James and C.G. Jung, Doorways to the Self, published by Analytical Psychology Press in uh, the year 2020, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Now, what is spiritual democracy? In my book, Walt Whitman, Shamanism, Spiritual Democracy and the World Soul, I had stated already in 1910, uh, 2010, excuse me, that spiritual democracy is a way to sacred action, whether through political activism, through advocacy for the environment, speaking up in community or in science, art, music, or the writing of poetry or prose. 
I later carried this forward in my uh, 2014 publication called Spiritual Democracy, a picture of which appears uh, on the um, thumbnail sketch for this uh, YouTube video. Now, spiritual democracy really exists throughout the entire cosmos. And it was William James who uh, Carl Jung said, gave him the idea that the human psyche expands to the infinite or uh, it, to uh, the cosmos itself. Now, we also can uh, attribute this um, uh, realization to uh, Humboldt, as well as to the reading uh, by Ralph Waldo Emerson of the Upanishads and uh, Sufism, particularly the works of Hafez, uh, which also Herman Melville was reading, the author of Moby Dick. Now, Melville's uh, year of birth was 1819, the same year as Walt Whitman, uh, to 1891. He and Whitman were exact contemporaries. Walt Whitman uh, spoke uh, in Leaves of Grass of the divine power to speak words. So a related technique to the method that Carl Jung called active imagination as a way to dialogue with figures of the unconscious, the collective unconscious, is what uh, Whitman called vocalism, the divine power to speak words. The quality of the right voice needs to be developed, Whitman asserted, grown, evolved. Vocalism was the method by which he said such an advancement could occur in the human soul, body, and spirit through the vocal center. What lies submerging uh, and slumbering in ready for use in our speech patterns is the quality of the right voice. All waits for the right voice, Whitman chanted. Thus, vocalism was simply called by him the divine power to speak words. He spoke of this in his uh, Chance Democratic to or oratists, to male or female, vocalism, breath, measure, concentration, determination, and the divine power to speak words. Are you eligible? Are you full-lunged and limber-lipped from long trial, from vigorous practice, from physique? Oh, now I see arise orators fit for inland America, and I see that power is folded in a great vocalism. Whitman published this in his 1860 edition of Leaves of Grass, which he also referred to as the New Bible. He spoke of birth giving. The miracle of birth was reflected in Whitman's own views on religious democracy. Whitman called what I'm calling spiritual democracy, religious democracy, in his essay, Democratic Vistas in 1871. Um, Spiritual democracy existed as an equality with everything that is for Whitman. The ability of the human soul to realize herself is dependent upon self-betterment. To give birth or uh, to birth the god or the goddess within. Whitman was very imperative, even emphatic. Birth giving was to him urgent. We must give birth to new ideas, images, symbols, earth words, before it is too late. In his uh, poem to the sayers of earth words, Whitman suggested that birthing the self was and continues to be a sacred obligation within each of us. Speaking, talking out loud, vocalizing, assumed a place of honor co-equal with the activity of visioning. 
this is key, for he asked, will you rot your own fruit in yourself there? Will you squat and stifle there? So becoming complete in oneself was confronting each reader with what is essentially a psychological problem. For we each have a divine child within us, as Carl Jung taught, a seed or a fruit of futurity. This is also what Meister Eckhart, the great Dominican theologian, said. Whitman said, I swear the earth shall surely be complete to him or her who shall be complete. The question was, will the fruit be stillborn, or will the reader or the listener of this uh, video find a vehicle, a vocation, a calling to make it truly living? The idea of birth giving was also central to Jung's psychology of what he called individuation, the Principium Individuationis, which we also find in the works of Friedrich Nietzsche, a term we find in Nietzsche, as well as in the works of William James, by the way. So Whitman's primary calling was to sacred activism, and this was mythopoetic. Now, Whitman wrote a beautiful uh, uh, journal entry for a lecture that he planned to give called God Abdicates. God Abdicates. I say to you that all forms of religion, without accepting one, any age, any land, are but mediums, temporary yet necessary, fitted to the lower mass ranges of perception of the race, part of the infant school, and that the developed soul passes through one or all of them to the clear homogeneous atmosphere above them. There all meet, previous distinctions are lost. Jew meets Hindu and Persian Greek, and Asiatic and European and American are joined. And any one religion is just as good <laughs> as another. Love that. So by this time, uh, spiritual democracy had emerged also in the works of the American uh, poets, uh, Emily Dickinson and Herman Melville. Now in Melville's Moby Dick, the key elements in the story address current global issues. These include uh, five uh, themes that I've outlined in my book, Spiritual Democracy. One, the separation and disseverance from nature and the animal world, a real global crisis. Two, shifting from top-down patriarchal myths of domination. Three, religious movement away from fundamentalism. Four, illumination of the inevitable darkness in humanity. Five, the need for dictatorships to fall. Now, poets who have used the method of vocalism have helped to articulate what our national myth is in the United States of America. And one of these poets was Emily Dickinson and her dates were 1830 to 1886. I've also written a book on Emily Dickinson published uh, by Fing Fisher King Press in 2018, Emily Dickinson, A Medicine Woman for Our Times. At the apex of the Civil War, so we're talking 1864, 1865. Dickinson wrote, God of the manacle, as of the free, take not my liberty away from me. So being unchained, 
and sharing equality with all people in the land of liberty was Dickinson's way to claim the name America for herself. She signed her name America in several letters as the forerunner of a new international myth. She saw that liberty had been compromised by slavery and emancipation paved the way for women's liberation. She was at Mount Holyoke uh, during the, um, uh, the first uh, women's rights uh, convention in 1848. In 15, right after the outbreak of World War I, Carl Jung had a colloquy or a dialogue in his Red Book with a figure he called Isdubar, which is uh, another name for Gilgamesh. And in this dialogue, his I, his ego consciousness, identifies with one being a mother of God, which, as we've seen, uh, was also there in the works of Walt Whitman, as well as in the works of uh, Meister Eckhart before either of them. I am the mother, Jung wrote, the simple maiden who gave birth and did not know how. My God, I love you as a mother loves the unborn whom she carries in her heart. Another principle that we find in Liber Novus or the Red Book is laying in a maternity bed as a pregnant mother. Since I am a giver of birth, uh, Jung wrote, whence do you delight me, O God? So here we get the poetical Jung. Now there's four basic postulates that I outline in my book of spiritual democracy that are found in Carl Jung's writings. And these are Jung's efforts to put forth a scientific myth of the self in four basic postulates. One, the new religious attitude expresses itself collectively through the transformations of human relations. Two, the way is symbolic. All paths point the way to the self as the way of what is to come. That's in the Red Book. Three, God is experienced as an internal image, and those that worship God in the new image will worship him or her as a supreme meaning. Four, we all have to be crucified symbolically on the cross of our own destinies. If we are to survive as a species, I also outline seven principles of spiritual democracy in the following way. One, individual religious experience comes above life, above life in any creed or religious community. Two, to be a proponent of a new religion is obsolete in a psychological age. Three, when a person succeeds in stopping to project the self onto a creed, state, or community, the self lives in one and will no longer be external or separate or different from one. For no creed possesses the absolute truth above other religions. Five, all images of divinity can be found in the collective foundation of the world soul. The self rules the whole of the human psyche. Six, all God images of the world's revealed religions must change as every living religion must change with the times. And seven, Jung prefers the term self because he's talking to Hindus as well as Christians, Buddhists as well as Sufis, and he does not want to divide but to unite religions. Most importantly, the self is inclusive of good and evil.
True democracy, wrote Jung in 1947, is a highly psychological institution which takes account of human nature as it is and makes allowances for the necessity of conflict within its own national boundaries. Spiritual democracy is, in Jung's psychological view, a matter of the heart and conscience. If the heart does not change, nothing changes. So at the end of my book, I list 10 ways that we can practice a spiritual democracy, uh, make it practical, or as William James said, pragmatic in his pragmatic psychology, which is a positive psychology. Um, and this is one, follow your conscience. James Madison had argued for putting conscience into uh, the religious clauses of the uh, American Constitution, but it unfortunately didn't get in there. Two, immerse yourself in nature. Uh, three, practice a vocalism and active imagination. Uh, four, watch your dreams. Uh, very important. Five, uh, practice tolerance, religious tolerance. Six, be mindful of judgments. Seven, beware of projections. Very difficult. Eight, consider a change in cultural attitudes. Our San Francisco analyst, Joseph L. Henderson, posited five basic uh, attitudes in his book, Cultural Attitudes and Clinical Perspective. In my book, I add another five. So there's really 10 uh, cultural attitudes that I uh, go over in my book. Nine, I got, um, make your voice heard, uh, make your vote count. 10, introduce others to spiritual democracy. Now, the reason, as I mentioned, that I have been um, speaking to you today about uh, spiritual democracy and its foundations in the American psyche and in the world's soul, which I'll continue in another uh, episode, on spiritual democracy when I cover the work of William James more in depth, as well as the work of Swami Vivekananda, the Hindu monk who came to speak at the Parliament of World Religions in 1893 and who met William James on three separate occasions, is that um, a great deal of uh, interest is uh, happening in the world, I could say in the world's soul, currently uh, centering on this topic. And there seems to be a lot of um, different uh, ideas about what spiritual democracy is and what its basic influences were. And, um, I think it's important to uh, trace this history so that uh, we get a clear picture of where the notion uh, really developed um, as an idea, as a theory, as well as a practice. And um, I'll be uh, speaking some more about that in, uh, as I said, uh, uh, at least two uh, upcoming uh, sessions. So thank you for listening uh, this morning. And um, I will um, hopefully see you again uh, relatively shortly in uh, the next episode. Bye-bye.